And let me also ask you to please mute so that um, we don't disturb Batya by our telephone ringing and, and all the rest of it. So I think I've got that under control. I'm Marilyn London and I'm membership chairman of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library and a board member. And um, on behalf of the Friends, we thank you all for coming tonight. Those of you who are friends, thank you so much for being a friend. And it is because of you that we are able to have bought you with us, which is always a treat. And the other facilitators who are also, um, you know, here for us, for you, and it's because of you. So thank you very much. If you are here for the first time or if you come occasionally and would like to get more information and become a friend, please check us out at www.sterlingfriends.org and let us know um, your thoughts. And we hope that you will for, you know, be, be a friend as well. Um, we have the month of December starting and there are just a couple of things I wanna to bring to your attention. If you're getting your newsletter, you're going to get this and you're going to know if you're not getting your newsletters, you're not getting your emails, please contact us and let us know you are not so that we can make sure that you are. We are 100% we are getting these glitches cleared up. So make sure that you are getting what you're supposed to get. Just to bring to your attention, Cinema Paradiso in person, will be on Tuesday the 12th. And the movie that we're showing is called uh, Dream Scenario. It is a brand new movie with Nicolas Cage. And um, it should be really interesting. And I and, uh, hope you could join us. We also will have two of Shelley's Zooms this month. It will be on a, next Wednesday and then again on the 27th. Check it out and join us. We always have great discussions. Linda Levin's um, book that she's discussing in person this, this month will be on the 19th and it will be The Sweetness of Water. And I believe it, it will be Zoomed by the JCC on Thursday. So if you can't make the, you can get it from the J on Thursday. If you're not sure how that works, let us know and we will clue you in. Uh, Miriam has her short story on um, the 26th and also the New Yorker is um, every Thursday from seven to eight. And I see Doris here and Linda, a couple of us, it's a small group of us and we have a really great discussion with Jerry Bain and um, join us. So get your information on the newsletter and that's it for me, Bacha. We all want to hear about Mary Cassette. I didn't realize for a long time that she was American. Yep. <laughs> I thought she was French. So yep. people knew, knew her from the US. Right. Before the US. Uh, Marilyn, just tell them how little they can donate so they don't get scared to donate and become a member. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bacha. To be a friend of the Sterling Road Library, membership starts at $10 a year. The biggest bargain in town, you couldn't even go to hear let Bacha speak for $10 for one lecture. So what you have to do is just join. Join at $10 a year and you get access to all of our amazing, amazing programs. Now, anybody could come to any of them. It is a public library. But from the friends, we get make the programs easy for you to access, to know about, when they're happening, we do serve a great purpose. We're a small library with a huge membership. Join us. Thank you, Bacha. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to share the screen and we'll start the class about Mary Cassatt. And as you're going to see, she is an impressionist artist. And many people, as Marilyn was saying, they think that she was French, but she was an American living in France and Actually, she died in France uh, at the age of 82. Her full name is Mary Stevenson Cassatt. She was a painter, but also a printmaker. That's very important to know because she's going to be a good friend of Degas. And Degas is going to teach her how to make those prints and etchings, etc. 
and she's going to focus in the social and private lives of women. We know her paintings through the representation of mothers and children and those intimate bonds between them, that connection as you're going to see. And in 1894, there's a description by Gustave Giffoy as one of Les Trois Grandes Dames, the three great dams of Impressionism. We know also of Mary Brackemond and Mary Berth Morisot, the other two that were as famous as her, but uh, probably Cassatt is better known because of her uh, proliferation of art that she made. She made so much art during her lifetime. She was born in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. Now it's part of, those, of Pittsburgh, 1844. And then we see that her father, uh, Robert Simpson Cassatt, later is going to change his name with a double T. At the beginning, it was just one T and two S's, as you can see here. He, they were from an upper middle class and he was a stockbroker, also a land speculator, and they descended from French Huguenots. So they have that connection with France. The, the, this French Huguenot was Jacques Cossart. He had come in the 17th century to New Amsterdam, which is going to become New York, as we all know. Her mother, she came from a very wealthy family, a banking family. She was very well educated. Uh, she read a lot and she would really love art. So she's going to influence her daughter, Mary Cassatt. This is one of her paintings of her good friend that is going to describe her mother, Louise Havemeyer, is going to write in her memoirs. Anyone who had the privilege of knowing Mary Cassatt's mother would know at once that this was from her and her alone, Mary inherited her ability. This is a painting that she does later of her good friend, Louisine Havemeyer. But also on the other hand, we have that she comes from a family of artists. She was a distant cousin of Robert Henry, he was from the Askan School of Realism in New York, and he would have one of his paintings. So just to show you that she had other people in her family that were also artists. She was one of seven children. Two of them died when they were babies, and it's a very large family. Her brother, Alexander Johnston Cassatt, he is going to become the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Rail, uh, railroad, and he was very wealthy, as uh, you can see one of the paintings, one of the portraits that she made of him later on. So the family moves first to Lancaster, and then they go, uh, when she's six years old, then um, this is a photograph of that time, later it's going to be part of the Philadelphia area, and then the family is going to travel around. The families that were well off, they would travel to Europe because for them, it was important to uh, teach the children. And this is part of education to go to Europe. The, her brother was ill and they, they go to Europe trying to find a cure for her brother. For five years, they are traveling all around. They go to London, to Paris, to Berlin and many other places. So as she travels, she's going to learn other languages like German and French. And she also learns drawing and music as they are traveling around. She gets to visit in London, the World's Fair at the Palais de l'Industrie. I'm, I'm sorry, this is in Paris. <laughs> I, said, I said London, uh, in 1855. So when she is there, she's, this is the first time that she gets to see important artists of the time that are ex ex uh, exhibiting at the, um, at the World's Fair, like Delacroix and Co. And Coubert, and I'm going to show you some of the paintings that were exhibited at that time, like this painting by Dominique Ang, La Grande Odalisque. At that time, we have the a fashion in art, which is Orientalism, and to trying to represent something that is from the Far East or from the Middle East or some place that is exotic and far away. And also, she's going to see paintings like this one by Eugène Delacroix. The brushstroke of Edwin de la Croix is very, very fast, and it looks like a sketch. And this is something that the Impressionists are going to take from de la Croix. So he is, he's one of the precursors of Impressionism, as well as the paintings by Jean-Baptiste Corot. Corot is going to paint people that are working landscapes as well. He's going to be focused on, on light and color. 
also one of the precursors of the Impressionists. But they're going to come back to the U.S. when her brother dies. And they are living in Philadelphia. And she wanted to become an artist. She knew from the beginning that she wanted to be a professional artist. She goes to study painting at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. She's 15 years old. But of course, her parents do not like that. She wants to become an artist. And they are concerned because of that feminist exposure, that those feminist ideas exposure, and the bohemian behavior of an artist. At that point, 20% of the students were female. And it was valuable to have that skill. But on the other hand, they did not want her to become a professional artist. She's going to continue uh, her art studies. And actually, some of the students are going to become very important, like Thomas uh, Ikins, later is going to become the director of the academy. And they're going to meet also in Paris later on. As you can see in this uh, photograph, this is a uh, photograph that happened a, a little bit later, because <coughs> at the time, uh, female students could not use any live models. So they would have to draw from cats. And she decided to study. Uh, wait a second, I'm going to mute all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, decided to study the All Masters on her own. And she is going to recall that moment. She says there was no teaching at the academy. She said that she did not learn the real thing as she would like. On the other hand, they, the academy later is going to allow female models, but not at her time, not when she was studying there. He would have a photograph, of, actually a, a drawing, well, a drawing of the drawing class with a live model, but that didn't happen when she was studying there. With her mother, she's going to move to Paris in 1866. This is a later self-portrait that she made after she met the Impressionist. But she's also is not allowed to go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. At the time, women could not attend any classes of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which was, of course, the famous art institute where people would learn how to paint. What she would do is to, to have private classes with Jean-Léon Jérôme. He was one of those Orientalists, as you can see one of his paintings, and she's going to learn how to use oil, of course, and how to paint in a different way than she was learning at the Academy in Philadelphia. Thomas Ickins, as I mentioned, also is going to become a student of Jean-Léon Jérôme later on. He will have a painting by Ickins, who's going to become later the director of the Academy in Philadelphia. But what she would do is to go to the museum. That was the way to learn, to copy the masters. And the you, you would have to have a permit, of course, to copy them and then se sell them. Um, by the way, it's really very interesting to see that it was a social place where people would meet. And the American female students would get to know French students there. And that was the way that you would meet people because you would not be able to go to any cafe if you were on chaperone. So this is how they socialize. So we have that her friend uh, and fellow artist, Elizabeth Jane Garner met at the museum and then married William Adolphe Borgero, one of the artists, of course, of uh, Paris at the time. So it is really interesting to see how they met at the museum. <clears throat> She's also going to uh, study with another artist, Charles Joshua Chaplin. You have one example of his uh, paintings. Always we see during this period too that we have representations of mythology or religious topics or historical themes as you have this one. It's an allegorical figure of the song Silence. But on the other hand, she's going to learn from here, from him, to paint scenes of that connection between a mother and a child. This one is a sister, an old sister with her, her younger sister. But that connection of feminine um, or, of, or, or that, that feminine touch that we're going to see throughout her work. Also, she gets more private classes by Thomas Couture, another of those painters that were very, very successful at the time. 
And by the way, Manet had taken classes also with Couture. He would have one of the paintings that he made early on, of course, in his career. <clears throat> what he learned from Couture was to go to the countryside. He would organize those trips to the countryside and students would draw from life the peasants, the daily activities that they were doing, for example, this man uh, walking, this lawyer going to court. And this is what she learns from Couture. This is a painting by Couture, by the way. <clears throat> so she begins to paint and she presents her work to be accepted at the Salon. This is one that was accepted, the mandolin player. And it is that combination of a romantic style from Corot and Couture, but also a, the kind of style and fashion that they wanted to have at the Salon. This is a painting by Coubert, and this is the uh, one of the famous paintings by Manet, because these two are artists of the avant-garde that are trying to break away from any academic tradition. They change the way they, they paint, the composition is a little bit different, the brushstroke is also very different from before, and at the, at the same time, she sees this, but, but she's going to continue to work in the very traditional manner. She, in the summer of 1870, there is a huge war, the Franco-Prussian War. We know that impressionists like Pizarro and Monet are going to go to London. And of course, they, the family, the, the, the mother and her, are going to return to live to, uh, to the US. And they go to Altoona, Pennsylvania. The whole family is there. And we have some of the painting that she does here. Her father doesn't want her to continue to be an artist. She doesn't, he doesn't approve, but he's going to pay for her basic needs, but not anything that has to do with art or any supplies. So she needs to sell art to have that extra money. This is a sketch that he, she does of her father, but also on the other side, you can see that she is reusing the uh, the canvas because she doesn't have enough money to pay uh, for another one. And she does on the other side, this uh, Mrs. Curry, who was one mulatto servant living with them. You can see how she is painting with an inspiration from others. This uh, a painting, A Boy Drinking Milk, is a very traditional pa painting. And at some point, she's not selling her art. She is uh, have two paintings in a New York gallery, but people love her work. Her work, but nobody is is buying anything. So she thinks that maybe she's going to give up art. She does not want to paint anymore. And at the same time, she loves painting, of course. And she sends a letter. She uh, is going to write about it. And she says, "I have given up my studio and torn up my father's portrait." and have not touched a brush for six weeks, not ever will again, until I see some prospect of getting back to Europe. I am very anxious to go out west next fall and get some employment, but I have not yet decided where. What happened is that uh, she tried her luck in Chicago and she lost some of her early paintings when she when the, the fire started in 1871. She had given those, those uh, paintings to be exhibited there and she lost them with the fire. But she gets a very important moment, a commission by the Archbishop of Pittsburgh to paint two copies of an artist, Antonio da Correggio, that you can see in Parma. It is a wonderful um, cloud space as they are um, <laughs> calling this kind of a dome painted that you can see all of the clouds and all of the people getting into heaven uh, or the saints that also are ascending uh, into heaven. And she is going to write, oh, how wild I am to get to work. My fingers itch and my eyes water to see a fine picture again. And she gets, of course, money for her travel expenses. And she's going to travel to Italy. This is one of her uh, photographs of that time uh, of, of her friend, uh, Emily Sartan. She is going to also be accompanying her and she had studied printmaking before. So also she's going to learn from her. This is a painting that she does while she is in, uh, in Europe, in, in Italy. Uh, it is a representation of Abacante, one of those devotees of the wine god, one of the assistants of the temples. It is inspired in Greek mythology, but she is represented here as a real person. 
Look at the music. We can even feel that she's dancing. Uh, she has also uh, vine leaves in her head, but also you can see that the tones that she's using are kind of warm as well as there's a lot of movement in this kind of painting. <clears throat> Jean Baptiste Corot's painting of Vacante is a little bit different because what he's representing here is a very sensual naked female in, uh, in, in on top of this uh, leopard skin, the same as we can see in this painting done later on by Gustav Klimt. This is Adam and Eve. And look at the, um, the representation of the leopard skin because that is a symbol of Eros, of the wild Eros, the, of course, uh, the, the, the god of love. And also the, the flowers are uh, part of the, the, the symbol of a fertility goddess, but very different from what she did, of course. It is a little bit more uh, inspired probably from Caravaggio, his Bacchus, the representation of the god of wine, the chiaroscuro, the famous, of course, uh, light and shadow that, that Caravaggio makes very often. As you can see, while she's traveling in Italy, working in Parma, she's painting also other genre paintings like this two women throwing flowers during a carnival. She's going to also offer this painting to the Paris Salon and it's going to be very well received and they're gonna actually purchase it. The Parma uh, people are going to really, uh, the Parma art community actually, not people in general, but they're going to encourage her. And what they say is that all Parma is talking of Miss Cassatt and her picture, and everybody is anxious to know her because they knew that she was a very talented artist. As you can see here, these two women are throwing those flowers. We don't see the balcony, but we see that they are talking or looking at somebody out there or down there, and they are interested in somebody, probably a gentleman, that it is uh, on the other side. Or this other one, when she travels to Madrid and also Seville, she travels on chaperone, she travels by herself. And this painting is one that she does while she's traveling there. Uh, another one of the same series of paintings, a Spanish dancer wearing a lace, lace mantilla. As we can see, Delacroix was also making things like that. He also was interested in representing uh, people from other countries. This on the left-hand side is by Delacroix. So it was part of the fashion. We are already talking that she is painting genre paintings after the bullfight. This is a relaxed moment of this, uh, the matador. He is... Um, lighting a cigarette, as you can see right here. So you don't see the violence of the bullfight or whatever happens on the other side. We see him with all of this beautiful costume with his hat while he is in a break uh, before or after. And because of the title after the bullfight is because of he already had his moment in the arena. We have an influence by Goya and also, of course, what she sees in Seville as she is traveling, those wolf fights, the Tauromachia famous series by Goya. Another of the series. And what she's focusing on is uh, the communication between this couple, this flirtatious scene between the wolf fighter and this girl. What we don't see is the bull. We see that she was inspired to paint different textures and the jewelry that is part of the costume of the man and also the the uh, the fabric of the dress of this girl, the same as the, even the flower. So she is very talented. She is representing scenes that she sees on the streets, like this or another one of the balcony, also a flirtatious scene, this very sensual. Again, we see girls that are flirting. Probably these are flirting with people also outside of the balcony very different or very, very similar at the same time with this one by Murillo, the famous painting at the National Gallery in Washington, the two women at a window. Murillo painted this girl with her, uh, the dueña as it was called. And this man is probably the one who controls these two women because probably they are courtesans or they are uh, being paid, they are prostitutes probably. 
because they are flirting. But also another influence of, of her paintings are Goya's own paintings of the Majas on the balconies, where we see these two men getting, of course, uh, behind the scenes of what is happening with these two girls that are flirting with somebody on the other side of the balcony. So it is an influence of Spanish painters. This one is the one that she does first, and this is another one that she does two years later, because there's a whole series and there's a whole progression of her paintings, of her genre paintings, as we find. Very different from Edouard Manet's own balcony. And as you can see, Manet is searching to do something different. She is also painting something that is traditional, but very sensual, but she's not exploring anything new. She's doing something that has already been seen. Uh, here we have the moment when she goes to Paris and decides to live in Paris. Her sister, Lydia, is going to join her. 1874, this is the moment when we have the first uh, Impressionist exhibition. And this is, she still is painting genre paintings. She's going to meet also another art student in Paris that visits uh, Cassatt, Abigail May Alcott. She is the sister of Louisa May Alcott, the little sister's um, author. Uh, so Abigail was also very talented. At that time, she is uh, in Paris and she's going to visit Mary Cassatt. This is one painting by uh, May Alcott. <clears throat> so she's going to be um, very outspoken and she criticized the politics of the Salon. She would make blunt uh, comments about it. And her friend, Sartan, is going to write that she is entirely too slashing, snobs all modern art. This day is the Salon pictures of Cabanel, Bonat, uh, all the names that were used to revere. Cabanel and Bonat are the successful artists at the time. This is a painting done exactly at that uh, same year, 1874 or this other one. So what happened really is that female artists would be often dismissed from the salon. And if they had a protector on the jury or a friend, probably they would have a chance to be accepted. She submits two pictures in 1875. One is refused by the jury because there was, uh, and an, an probably what she was more daring. So, so she's going to darken the background and the following year, when she is offering again the same painting, is going to be accepted. She was very cynic, and she quarrels with her friend Sartan. And Sartan thought that Cassatt was too self-centered, too blunt and outspoken. She keeps on painting genre paintings like this one. And she starts to change. She moves away from genre painting. She is interested in representing everyday life representations like this one, woman on a striped sofa with a dog. She has very few commissions and she wanted to attract the Americans that were um, in Paris, they were expats in Paris or traveling around to have commissions to do their portraits, somehow to get a little bit more money, of course, and have those commissions. This is one of, of the first paintings that she does of a portrait. This is, it's called Portrait of a Lady, but it is Miss Mary Allison. She does two portraits of her. Actually, Sartan is going to introduce her to Louisine, who's going to become a very good friend of her. She is going to marry Havemeyer. That's why she gets the last name of Havemeyer. She's going to become one of the best art collectors in the US, in the US and a patron of Cassatt and many other artists. Here we have how she is exploring a different kind of brushstroke. Learn, of course, from the Impressionists with the interest in reflection and the sketch-like brushstroke that we see, this uh, very fast brushstroke to capture a moment, that contemplative mood, uh, the mirror, of course, the, that expands the depth of the room. Or this other one, that she presented at the Salon, it was rejected. For the first time in seven years, she has no works at the Salon. Of course, for her, this is a terrible blow because through the Salon, you get to be noticed and people are going to buy your art. The other thing that happens is that she is seeing uh, in an art dealer's window, 
paintings by Degas, especially his pastels. And she's going to admire the way that he uses space and movement. And she is going to write, I used to go and flatten my nose against that window and absorb all I could of his art. I It changed my life. I saw art then as I wanted to see it. I, as they meet, they're going to meet, Edgar the guy is going to invite her to show with the rest of the Impressionists. At that time, they were not called themselves Impressionists. They called themselves the Independence or the Intransigence. And one of friend of the Cassats, Henry Bacon, is going to say about the Impressionists that are so radical, they are afflicted with some hitherto unknown disease of the eye. People did not like the Impressionists whatsoever. And this is a portrait done by Edgar Degas uh, of Miss uh, Cassatt later on. The whole family is going to join her in 1877. They're going to share this large apartment. This is uh, the building still standing there. And uh, they live in the fifth ward of that building. So with Berth Morisot, as I mentioned, she's going to be one of the Impressionist artists. Berth Morisot was married to Eugene Manet, the brother of Edouard Manet, and she's going to become very close to Mary Cassatt. Also, Brackemont is going to be part of that very close group of the Impressionists. As you see this painting, it reminds us of paintings by Monet or by Pissarro. And she, she learns how to paint en plein air, to go outdoors, to bring her canvas and her oil paints and bring and, and, and paint as she's looking at something and capture a moment, uh, the light at that time or the wind or the smoke. And you find that she is very much, very, very close to the paintings by Monet. On the left hand side, you see the painting by Monet, and on the right hand side, you see Mary Cassatt. The puppies, of course, people interacting with the flowers, the sky, the clouds, and are very similar in technique as well. <clears throat> in 1879, there's another World's Fair, and they are the impression is are going to postpone their exhibition. This is when she was going to exhibit with them. And they get another show apart from the world exhibition in 1879. And she declared, we are carrying on a despairing fight and need all our forces. As you find here in this cartoon, uh, the Turks buying Impressionist paintings to be used in case of war, of course, making fun of the Impressionists. They were still not very well accepted. Probably this is one of her masterpieces of that period. And it's going to be, uh, her paintings are going to be selected for the American section of the exhibition of the Universal Exhibition, the Exposition Universal. Uh, the next year, they're going to have their own Impressionist ex exhibition at the same international exhibition. And this painting, which is a little girl in a blue armchair, shows you how she is interacting with the Impressionists. Because what we find right here is First of all, the naturalism of childhood, as she is just relaxing, sitting down. And this was a daughter of a friend of Edgar Degas. But we also see the space in the middle, which is as important as the rest and the light that comes through those windows on the back and the striking blue color of those sofas. And of course, this um, balancing the composition, we see the dog on the left. It, it, it is not the only representation of a child just sitting down and relaxed on a sofa. So it is the same posture as this contemporary artist, Kuznir, as we can see this uh, child that has also the brushes on her hand as she is uh, very, very tired. So we have the same attitude of this child on her painting. But look at the brush stroke as well. With a few lines, she gets to have the decoration of the sofa. And as I mentioned, the space in the middle is as important as the rest of the composition. And there is a deep diagonal space as you have that um, angular 
composition and angular perspective. She gets to collaborate with the guy and the guy is going to have some brush strokes in this painting, like the light that comes through the window. Look at the details of the dog. And as I mentioned, the brush strokes that also are decorating the sofa and even the socks of the girls, of the girl. She becomes a true impressionist. The art dealer, Ambrose Vollard, is going to acquire this painting. And it is a very famous painting. When we have other artists, also contemporary artists, like this painting by Edmond Charles Tarbell, Edmond, Edmond Charles uh, was an American who was living in, uh, in Paris. And also he's focusing on the same idea of the space and the light from the window and a relaxed pose. In this case, is not a child, it is a young woman. But you can see the point of what the impressionists were doing. They are painting a figure that is off-centered and it draws our attention to other things around the room. They are also focusing on space and light. So she's going to be presenting at the impressionist exhibition. Her father insisted she is not, he's not going to pay for anything else that the basic needs and she has she wanted to have her studio, of course, and she needed money. But she lived um, still um, with her parents during this period, and she had to buy her own art supplies. She paints her mother as this new woman. This is uh, her vision. This is a woman who's reading the newspaper. She's reading Le Figaro. And it is her mother, actually, and also the interest in representation of the reflection on the window. That is also very common, using her eyeglasses as well, and also focusing on this. So it is an everyday life moment, and she's capturing in this case. Many of her paintings during this time, and some of them are going to be exhibited at the salon, is a representations of, are the representation of, of women, of young girls, like this one here that probably is a portrait of Genevieve Mallarmé, the, assist, the daughter of Stefan, uh, the poet, Stefan Mallarmé. They, go, they can go to the theater, of course. They could not go to any cafe without any chaperone. They were single. They are, there's a whole art of how to use a fan to flirt. Also, they get their best clothes to go to the theater and they enjoy themselves as well as they are kept there. This is, by the way, this is uh, Genevieve Mallarmé probably. Also the view from the uh, lodge. She starts to explore using different techniques and combining media like pastels, wash, and metallic paints. That's why we have, we have that shiny feeling in some of her paintings during that time. So what she's look, we're looking here is the image of this girl looking down into the stage. We don't see the stage. We see the people in front and probably also down, but we even don't see her features. Part of it is covered with a fan. And at some point we have that there is an intention of showing the fan as probably the first object that we see. It is uh, in front of us and in, in, in the center. If we compare this painting by Degas at the theater with this one by Cassatt, we have a different view. Degas is also painting a woman on uh, inside that, that box, looking down at the ballerinas. Also, we see a fan, we see her hands. We don't see the face of this woman in that box, in that lodge. We see that the lights are very strong here on the stage. And the guy is focusing on the ballerinas. He's interested in representing movement and also light. So the angle is a bit different of how they are painting. But they, of course, she's going to be influenced by the guy. The importance of the media is because we can see that she's exploring different techniques. This painting, by the way, was sold in 2007 for $7.5 million. And it is another girl also uh, in the theater, at the theater in, the, in a lodge. She's gazing to the right. The reflection of the mirror behind uh, is as important as her because we find the profile, we see also a fan, 
but we see her hair, the um, the lamp on the top, and also the uh, the audience on the other side, on the reflection of the wind. It's a beautiful painting. And also we have that her sister was very close to her. Casa did not want to marry because then she wouldn't have to end up her career. She wanted only to be a painter. And Lydia is one of her um, of her models. She is painting her in several locations, as you find her here uh, crocheting in the garden at Marley, because they would be very often together. Lydia is never married either. She was very ill all through her life and died in 1882. She uh, Mary was so sad that she wasn't able to work for uh, a few months. And here we have her also in another painting. <clears throat> so Degas is going to influence her, as I mentioned, to experiment with different medium and uh, to use different materials, not only metallic paint, but also distemper, which is a little bit different. And it is very quick drying, so it's very hard to paint on top of it. And anything that you make, it's going to show. So that is very hard. It's more, more or less like watercolors in that respect. As you can see here also, it, he, she would use this kind of, of media because it gives her, it gives her more um, light and a little more uh, brilliance into her paintings. But she also is going to use pastel and engraving because of the Degas. Degas was using a lot of these techniques. And also Cassatt, on the other hand, is going to help Degas sell his paintings in the US. She had all the connections. Their family, as I mentioned, were wealthy. She knew a lot of people. And through her, he's going to be known in the US. So this is another painting that she does with pastels or this other. She gets to be very, very good using pastels and uh, she does a lot of them using this technique like this one. She gets to uh, be in front of many masterpieces and the guy is already 45 years old when um, they, they meet. Uh, so of course she's younger and often the family is going to invite the guy to her, 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 their house and they're gonna have dinner with the whole family. She visits the museum with uh, her sister very often before she died, of course, in 1882. But this is a painting done of Edgar Degas of Mary Cassatt with her sister at the museum, at the Louvre. We have a whole series of them that Degas painted, uh, inspired, of course, on the two girls observing and reading the catalog or the pamphlet that they had about all of the paintings on the walls. So we have a series of paintings that he made, they got of them together, and they are going to collaborate. Actually, they, they had the studios very close nearby so you could walk from one to the other. So we have like a five minute stroll between the two the, uh, studios. So he's going to help her out and she's going to also influence him somehow. This is another painting of uh, the two of them at the Louvre by Degas. So she begins to do uh, etchings and different techniques also in engraving. Dry point is one of them. And they are going to collaborate. They're gonna have a project doing this kind of, of techniques, of printing techniques. She's going to learn a lot uh, through that. This is another um, uh, another uh, work by Degas. This is one of the ones that got uh, to be made as an etching. Again, we see Mary Gassat with Lydia, her sister, and they are looking at a famous, um, uh, it, it's an actual, it's an actual uh, funerary um, monument wall. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, um, it's a, I'm sorry, it's an Etruscan, it's an Etruscan funerary uh, monument and sarcophagus that is still there at the Louvre and here we have it in front of them. <clears throat> but as she's mastering this printmaking technique, uh, because Edgar, I'm sorry, Edgar Degas owned a printing press, she is going to collaborate with him. And look how beautifully done is this one right here. But all of a sudden, Degas doesn't want to work anymore in that project. And they were collaborating together, not only 
America side, but also Pizarro and some other artists. And Degas doesn't want to work in that project anymore. Degas was uh, very close to her at that time. They had similar tastes in art and literature. They had similar backgrounds because both of them were from the higher echelon of society, never married, both of them. There are no letters. We don't know if there was something else. So we don't know exactly how the relationship uh, was, if they were really intimate or not. But Degas was very temperamental. And uh, somehow um, we know a little bit about uh, their, their his sexual restraint because of Van Gogh's letter, let's say, about that. But she will keep on doing uh, the technique of printing. So he will have one that she made like 50 impressions in the opera house is the topic. She never, after this, she never worked with the guy as closely as she was on, on, until that point. But also we see that uh, the guy and Cassatt are going to be really influenced by Louis Edmond Durandi, who was an art critic. And the, the, she was very interested in the human figure. <clears throat> There's another exhibit organized by the Impressionists, 1879, and it's going to be a success, economically speaking. But of course, there were uh, critics, critics about it, uh, criticism about it. And uh, Gustav Kaye, but one of the friends, also an Impressionist artist, is going to organize and underwrite the show. I love this painting because uh, they show you, first of all, her own view of a uh, girl at the theater, uh, at the opera. This is one that was exhibited at that time. And it is Lydia, it is her sister, of course, uh, a younger representation of Lydia. And this other one, which we see that they are in that box uh, with the binoculars looking down at the upper level of the opera. And of course, the fans that would hide uh, from the onlookers. And this one is uh, one famous painting, as is this one as well, the opera house. And I love this one as well, because look at this girl. She is uh, this woman. She's looking through those um, opera glasses or binoculars. She has her fan, of course. And then we have another man right here looking at her or at somebody else. So everybody's looking at someone. She's not looking down. She's looking at the audience, at the people that are around her. This is an interesting uh, way of representing. While uh, we find that Degas has a different viewpoint, a different way of, of looking at, and, and of course we know that she was, he was, I'm sorry, Degas was focused on movement and light. And of course the series of ballerinas that he made. So at this point, she is going to end up making this theater scenes and she's going to change. Uh, this is a detail. So you can see this man looking at somebody else or maybe at her. <clears throat> so <clears throat> she is interested also in helping out the guy, even though they're not working together anymore. The, the, she starts actually buying work by Degas and also by Monet. For example, this uh, this fan that was painted by Degas and later she's going to sell it to her friend, Louisine Havemeyer. That's why uh, most of those uh, paintings and collection, our collection is going to end up at the Metropolitan Museum. This is Louisine uh, Havemeyer when she marries. Cassatt is going to become her art advisor and she begins to collect the Impressionists. As I mentioned, much of her art collection is going to end up at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. She's going to participate in other Impressionist exhibitions, the one in 1880, 1881, and until 1886, she's going to become an active member of the Impressionist circle exhibiting with them. She's going to represent the new woman. She is representing this woman and child, and child driving and as you find her uh, here, look at the uh, the woman taking the role of a man as she is getting the reins of this carriage. We don't see the horse. This is also an impressionist characteristic where you can cut part of the figures that you are representing. 
So it is uh, the new woman represented by her with her own view, but also the traditional rituals among the upper middle class women, like having tea in an apart in their apartment. This is a Paris apartment. The silver uh, tea set in the foreground is very important. And as you find the two ladies, the two girls drinking tea uh, in, in Paris, but also the decoration, the background, the fireplace, the vase on top of it, and part of a mirror or a painting in the background. And actually one critic is going to say about this painting that the wretched sugar uh, the, uh, bowl remains floating in the air like a dream that she did not make the, um, the correct way of representing the silver um, tea set. Also, we find that she uses a very fast brush shot as all of the impressionists would do. This painting, which is a portrait of Mary Dickinson Riddle, she was uh, Cassatt's mother's first cousin. She's going to make this painting as a gift because Mrs. Dickinson uh, gifted them a blue and white Canton porcelain service. And as a uh, thank you, she's going to paint this uh, this painting. This is the kind of, 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 of uh, cups that she received as a gift. Look at the proportion and the way that she balances the whole scene. There is at uh, the foreground, the table, and this is separating us from the sitter, from this uh, girl, from this lady, I'm sorry, like it would be a holy representation with the parapet, like this one by Bellini, that also is um, telling us we are in a different place or we are on the other side of the table also drinking tea. But actually, she did not like it. She did not like the gift. Cassatt very often is going to pose for Degas in her, the series of the millinery shops, like you see her here, trying one hat. And very often we see her also uh, posing for, for him. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a painting that he does. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, that she does a self-portrait, unfinished self-portrait. And you can see that the painting that he does of her, she's wearing the same dress because it was the same day probably or probably she used, it, she used it again. So it is interesting to see that interaction between those two artists. She begins also to paint everyday intimate moments of girls and, 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 and women in general, like this girl arranging her hair that the guy is going to buy. And we can see the difference between the guy's paintings and Cassatt's painting, because Degas is going to be interested in representing awkward postures as um, a model would be just brushing her hair and unaware of the artist painting her. While Cassatt gives her portraits or her paintings a much more interest, uh, she, she shows more interest in uh, representing this intimate moment, but more with more dignity. Degas is presenting a different angle usually a high vantage point looking down. <clears throat> Very often we see that she starts painting her family or commissions to do uh, mothers with children that are babies or children that are uh, being hugged by their mothers. So she does several po uh, portraits of her nephew, Joseph Gardner Cassatt number three. Uh, it was the son of her brother, Grad Gardner, uh, his sister-in-law, Jean Carter, Jeannie. At that time, we have the Dreyfus affair. Uh, he was court-martial, uh, of on, uh, uh, and, and, and it was, um, he was trial as a traitor and, um, he actually was innocent, and for many years that was uh, something that, that divided whole, the whole country of France. But that affected her relationship with Degas. For example, here on the right, we see a painting that she did, one of the relatives of Dreyfus. And we see uh, that she kept on having 
her own ideas, political ideas. The guy was um, in, 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 and actually he, he separated himself from all of his Jewish friends, including the painting Pizarro, because he was an anti-Dreyfus. And of course, it was a, a, a completely um, biased uh, trial. But that's for another um, class. Kassad actually organized and brought the first Impressionist paintings to the US. She um, advised uh, Louisine uh, Havemeyer to buy this painting, the rehearsal of the ballet on stage is one of the masterpieces done by Degas. The art dealer who organized uh, in 1886, the first impression and exhibition in the US was Paul Durand Well, the one that also financed some of the exhibitions of the impressionists in France. And he brought with him two paintings of uh, Cassat uh, to the US. As I mentioned at the beginning, Cassat is best known. Uh, it was best, she was best known in France much more than in the US. She was not selling anything to anybody from America, but she gets to paint many portraits from her family members. Like this is his her brother, Alexander Cassat, with uh, his son, Roberto Kelso. And this is when we see how she moved away from Impressionism, making simpler, much more straightforward representations. And she begins to exhibit in New York galleries for the first time after she has her whole career in France. We have many paintings that are dedicated to mothers with children in intimate moments or in moments like this one, breakfast in bed, while this mother is hugging her baby and she has her breakfast in her night uh, night um, table on the side. She's going to buy Chateau, the Chateau Bofranes uh, in Mesnil Terreview. And actually she's going to stay there. She's gonna travel very often to the, uh, to the US. But at the end of her life, she is going to be still living in this uh, chateau, her property, she's going to paint very often the uh, the lake that was uh, very close to her house. The uh, also the um, the landscape surrounding her house. But most of her paintings during this period are um, related to commissions of women that wanted to be portrayed with their children. So we have many of them. She died when she was 82 years old, being a very successful artist, very prolific with many, many paintings all around the world in many, many museums. Well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop the share. So if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, this is the time to make them, thank you. Any questions, comments? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lolita. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. No questions. I love how she painted with the, the mothers and children. Oh, beautiful. Yes, yes. I, I, I remember that we had a class dedicated only to that <laughs> a few <laughs> a few years ago. It was about uh well, it was Mother's Day. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> <laughs> that can be changing a little bit and not be focusing only on that. I just showed you some of them. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and the I'm Garner here. lady, the from the museum. I'm sorry. The, her um, sister in law or whatever, Garner. Is oh, she the no, one from Isabella the Garner Garner no, museum? No, 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 no. Nothing to do with Isabella Garner. That's uh, uh, okay. another one. Yes. I know you're you're talking about the, the Isabella Gardner Museum in Boston. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking what you're writing. Thank you, everyone. Thank Any you. We leave. Happy Thank holidays. You. Happy holidays to everyone. And see Thank you. Me. Well, I'll see you in January, but there's a lot of things going on in the library. Thank you. Bye and thank you. Thank you, Batia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. I am going to um, end the end the class now. So, um, happy holidays. There won't be another botcha till January. Marilyn, just real quick, I wanted to ask: Did her father ever come around? I think she's gone, so I don't know. Oh, she's she gone did. already. Okay, I typed it in, but she didn't see it in time. Okay. Okay. Then. See you later. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.